Hey there! With Hexblast Miner becoming the most played build by top players of PoE right now, surpassing the likes of even Righteous Fighter and Lightning Arrow, I thought it would be a great idea to put together a build guide for its older and entirely less powerful brother, Lame Blast. <coughs> Flame Blast. For those of you newer to the game that have never heard of Flame Blast before, welcome! Here are some other skills you've probably never heard of. Flame Blast is a spell that places a small pizza on the ground that grows into a jumbo as you channel it that also deals more and more damage the longer you hold it up for, up to a cap. Upon release, the fiery circle explodes dealing a ton of fire damage. Yeah, it isn't called Flame Blast for nothing. Now, if you've spent more than 5 seconds in the map before and you've been paying attention, you'll have realized why this skill is complete garbage, standing still. Thankfully, there are ways to make the skill not only playable but actually good at something, and that's what this video is going to be all about. Welcome to my somewhat comprehensive Flame Blast Inquisitor Guide, otherwise known as I Tried Flame Blast So You Don't Have To. First things first, I need to come clean and make it very clear to you that I did not make this build. Okay, got it? As I do when League starting, I browsed PoE Ninja for build ideas and found this one guy doing Flame Blast differently from the rest of the pack. He had a lot of life, a surprising amount of damage, and a somewhat clever name that obviously didn't go as planned. So I did what anyone would do and blindly trusted that this build would work out without planning anything. This only sort of half worked. As it turns out, I later found out that he had been using Tabixi's Firestorm Inquisitor as the skeleton and inspiration. So shout out to that build as well if you're interested. I'll leave a link right below the like button. Had I read that guide first, I would have made some smarter pathing choices early on. With that out of the way, let's get started. At its core, the build revolves around taking advantage of a pretty cool unique called Wrath Pith Globe, which scales our damage based on our maximum life. This is why it's not only a great idea defensively to stack life to increase survivability, but having a large amount of HP actually increases our damage and becomes an incredibly efficient stat to invest into. Now, this is all well and good, but there is a small price to pay for using this shield. A blood price, to be exact. Spells sacrifice 10% of your life each and every time you use them. As scary as this sounds, thankfully this can be accounted for and made more or less obsolete by having a ton of life regen. To get the bulk of this life regen, we go for the Inquisitor Ascendancy, grabbing both Consecrated Ground Nodes as well as the Ellie Pen and Crit Notes since we are scaling our crit as much as possible. In fact, it's actually really quite easy to be crit capped with this build and you'll wish there was something you could do with all the excess crit chance you'll have laying around. The rest of your life regen comes from your gear and gems, but I'll go into more detail on that later. Before getting into the nitty gritty, let's just go over some of the strengths and weaknesses of the build so you can decide whether this is for you or not. Starting with a pro. This build scales quite nicely. Each new piece of the puzzle you add to the build really has an impact on your gameplay and this sense of chasing after the next upgrade just keeps going. Now I know this can be said of most builds, but I just figured I'd throw it out there. Also, cause I'm sure some of you are wondering, at this point I've put in roughly 35 to 40 divines into the build, but again, I started from scratch. Conversely, this build needs upgrades to really start feeling good. While you can technically start from zero, which is what I did, there absolutely was a point in my progression where the build didn't feel too hot when trying to push through yellow and red maps. I cannot in good conscience recommend this build to brand new players or players that don't have at least a few divines to get started. Also no, this is not SSF viable. Actually, let me just go out and say it, it's not really a great mapper. While there are ways to make it within what I would consider a totally acceptable mapper, notably a ton of cast speed and some source of explosion, the fact that you have to stand still to channel Flame Blast means that it will never compete with the meta speed mappers. Also, our movement speed is less than desirable. If you've got ideas on how to get more move speed without sacrificing a bunch of tackiness or damage, I'm all ears in the comments. What it is good at though is bossing. Now, I'm not talking about Ubers. I did get Uber Cortex down with it on the first try, but take a look at my Uber Eater attempt. Yeah. I'm talking about your regular bosses, Shaper, Cyrus, Eater, Exarch, those guys. What this build lacks in mobility, it more than makes up for in overall tankiness and raw upfront damage. For what it's worth, Huey Ninja bust me at a whopping 51 mil, which is definitely mega inflated. Okay, I'm gonna let you in a little secret. Where this build actually shines though is in the Forbidden Sanctum. You probably wouldn't think so considering it's self-cast and not totems or mines or something like that, but it handles the Sanctum well. Guards get one or two taps, reserving 60% of your life isn't an issue, bosses are easy peasy, and if you lose your run to traps or terrible affliction choices like me, well that would be what I like to call a skill issue. Is it better than the other strong Sanctum builds that can do no hit runs and whatnot? Of course not, but it is different and that's good enough for me. 
Which brings us to my final pro. The biggest reason to play this build is that it's hipster as shit and you can dunk on your friends saying things like, oh yeah, well my flame blast build can fuck you up IRL or something else even more clever. Er. Huh? Likewise, the biggest reason not to play this build is that you're playing Flame Blast. Okay, so hopefully that sold you on the build. Let's get into the details here. I'll be going over gearing choices, skills and gems, our passive tree, the ascendancy nodes, a brief bit on leveling the build, and lastly, some general advice and tips to playing it. Starting off with gearing. The most important piece of this build to get started is the Wrath Pith Globe Unique Shield. As mentioned before, it allows us to scale our spell damage and crit chance via stacking as much life as possible, with the downside that our spells cost a huge chunk of life. With this in mind, the most important stats our build needs are life, resistances, obviously, life regeneration to mitigate the downside, extra levels to fire spells or all spells, generic spell damage or fire damage, and cast speed. In fact, I would absolutely prioritize cast speed over spell damage any day of the week, since Flame Blast just doesn't feel good without it. Once you reach something like 15 casts per second like me, you won't even feel like you're channeling at all, except for when you do. Wrath Pith is the one piece of the build that you'll never need to upgrade, so do yourself a favor and get yourself a decent one from the get-go. In our body armor slot, we're going for the tried and true Infernal Mantle. Infernal Mantle gives all socketed fire skills a huge plus 3 to skill levels, 100% global crit, and converts some of our fire damage to chaos. Which uh, actually doesn't matter once you have 100% crit thanks to our SMC, but I digress. Now you might think, what? There's no life on it? And yeah, there isn't, but worry not, that is okay. This allows us to pick up the life mastery that gives 15% increase max life if there are no life mods on your chest piece. It's a win-win. Also, in case you're scared of that 100% increased spell damage taken when on low mana thing, don't be. We have no mana to begin with. That's right, surprise, this is a blood magic build. Start with a regular 6 link version of the Infernal Mantle, but eventually you'll want to upgrade it to a plus 2 or even a plus 3 corrupted one, if you can manage to snatch one. For you big spenders out there, you can also go for the skin of the Lord's Route with Painted Tomb in on there for some even bigger numbers, but that's outside the scope of this video. Also, if you're really going all out on the Sanctum, you could try slotting in an Expedition's End here instead so that your fire damage can freeze the guards at the cost of dealing less damage. I'll leave that up to you to try though. In our Helm slot, we're going for a Sandstorm Visage. This helm is excellent for a lot of reasons. First off, it gives cast speed, we already established that's important. Then it has the line, ignore stuns while casting. Getting stunned while channeling flame blast will get you killed, so this is a great way to avoid that as much as possible. Lastly, and most importantly, it has base spell crit chance is equal to that of your main hand weapon. What this means is that instead of our flame blast virgin base spell crit chance of 5%, we get to use our main hand weapons chad 10% or more crit instead, making it super easy to get crit capped. We are forgoing getting an enchant on this helmet because no lab runner in their right mind would ever put a flame blast enchant on a visage. You could look on TFT for a lab enchanting service or try running it yourself, but I would rather be stuck flipping silver coins for hours than doing that. Oh wait, that's exactly what I've been doing. This brings us to our weapon. We are looking for a wand that has a base crit of 9% or more, the higher the better, with plus one to either all spells or to just fire spells, ideally both, but that gets expensive fast. And more than 20% cast speed and some combination of spell damage or added fire damage to spells. These can get pricey, so just work your way up starting with something more budget friendly and get upgrades as needed. As for our gloves, these are basically the simplest slot. We just want rare gloves with plenty of life, some life regeneration percent, and resistances. I found this pair while mapping and have never felt the need to upgrade them beyond adding the Eldritch Implicis via Eldritch Currency. The chance to unnerve is a pretty huge DPS increase, make sure to add that when you can. The damage per strength is negligible. On our boots, we want as much move speed as possible, at least 30% to get started. One of the weaknesses of the build is its mobility, so every percentage counts here. Then you want life, life regeneration, and resistances. The best enchant would probably be the movement speed one, but I settled for some extra cast speed. On our rings, we just want a high life roll, more than 14% cast speed ideally, resistances, some intelligence can be very helpful, and maybe a plus one to minimum frenzy charges if you can squeeze that in. Nothing too fancy. For our amulet, we have a few options. Replica Dragon Fang with plus three to flame blast is a solid option that's pretty budget friendly. Otherwise, a plus one to fire or all spells amulet with crit multi, life, and cast speed is a nice upgrade. Beyond that, you could go for a plus two amulet, but that just gets super costly and it's not that much of a damage increase. Of course, there's also ashes, but it's 
really not that much better either, so that's up to you. For our anointment, there are a few considerations. Heartseeker is never bad, Disciple of the Slaughter gives us Frenzy Charge Generation and is what I opted for, and Mark the Prey is great if you're just bossing. You've got options. Lastly, for the belt, we go for a well-rolled Darkness and Throne to slot in a couple nice maximum life, cast speed, and crit multi-abyss jewels. A rare leather belt with lots of life and resistances works in a pinch. A quick note when buying gear, always make sure you have enough resistances to be capped. I personally ignored Chaos Res since I mostly use this character in the Sanctum where Chaos Damage is not much of a concern, but if you plan on primarily mapping with this guy, don't forget about the Chaos Res. You will die a lot without it. Speaking of jewels, we do go for a few of them. Our base jewels have some combinations of max life, cast speed, and as much crit multi to spells, fire, or elemental skills as we can afford. This is also a decent spot to grab any resistances you might be missing. Pick these up only when you have the rest of the skill tree pretty much done and you're looking to fit in even more damage. We also have a large cluster jewel setup. We go for the fire damage one and ideally we want it to have 12 passes but I settled for 11. It's whatever. You don't want any fancy notables on it, instead you just want some small passes grant all attributes to help you reach the dexterity requirements for your gems, cast speed with fire spells, and 35% increased effects so that each small passive point gives you a nice DPS boost. You can also grab a nice megalomaniac like I did for cheap. I got this for 20c, I wouldn't really look for anything specific specific, just keep your eyes open for moss that are all helpful so that no point is wasted. Lastly, I do have a Watcher's Eye. Watcher's Eye is just a great jewel overall. Mine has crit multi with anger and something to do with arcane surge and zealotry, which I got for two divines. There are a lot of good options here, so feel free to look around and test things out in POB for your specific character. You can always just slot in another rare jewel with life and crit multi though, and it'll be solid too. For forbidden jewels, you could go for the arcane blessing ones for about a huge 20% more damage, but the going rate for a pair of those is about as expensive as the entire rest of this build, so I would definitely only consider that if you're really trying to push this to its limit. Now, the man, the myth, the legend, the root firestorm himself swears by using the red nightmare to get more block chance, and I certainly see where he's coming from. But I personally never bothered with that because I'm more of a just don't get hit kind of guy, aka an idiot. Just thought I would mention it in case you want to go in a more defense oriented route. When paired with fire resistance tattoos, you can get a lot of block chance, so it is an option to consider. Okay, last piece on the gear agenda, flasks. I run an all utility flask setup now, but I recommend starting out with a life flask early on so that you have some source of very, very quick life recovery. Otherwise, we have all our staples, a gotta go fast flask, a gotta go cast flask, a get hurt by righteous fire less flask, and an oh shit, I'm an idiot flask, and lastly, a delete the enemy flask. Yeah, that one's the least important. When I'm in the Sanctum, I swap out the Quartz Flask for an Atsiri's Promise since the phasing is pretty useless there. You could also always go for a Granite Flask for more armor. Lots of options. Okay, great. I think that's it for gearing. Next up, skills and gems. Alright, so I'll start off with our main Flame Blast setup and then go into our utility gems afterwards. In our chest piece Infernal Mantle, we want Flame Blast linked with increased critical damage, infused channeling, awakened elemental focus, cruelty, and either increased area of effect or concentrated effect, depending on what we're up to. In a perfect world, we would want a level 21 Val Flame Blast of 20% quality, but I think I'd have to go out and make my own for that, so I settled for having two different Flame Blast gems. One level 20 Val Flame Blast, which I use for mapping, since Val Flame Blast is a really nice button to press that basically eliminates any threat, and second, a level 21 regular Flame Blast that I use for bossing and in the Sanctum, since I find it's more consistent and consistency is key in those higher pressure situations. Woke Ellie Focus is really nice since it gives plus one to levels to our Flame Blast, which by the way, in case you're newer to the game, spells scale really well with extra levels up to a certain point, but you definitely don't need it to get started. A regular elemental focus will do. Increased critical damage does give us a ton of damage, however, if you're earlier on in your progression of the build and you don't have much cast speed yet, I would highly recommend using faster casting here instead. Cast speed is really important for Flame Blast to feel good enough for you to not want to test the laws of gravity head first. I constantly swap between increased AoE and conk effect in that Flame Blast setup. If I'm just doing some chill mapping, I'll for sure use increased AoE to make the clear feel better, but against tougher bosses like Cyrus and Shaper and whatnot, conk effect is much better. Whichever one I'm not using in my main setup, instead fits into my Righteous Fire setup. Speaking of RF, let's talk about it. The main reason we want to use Righteous Fire is for this 30% more spell damage buff it grants while active, but it's also great at melting little annoying white trash you'll run into. Oops, did I say that out loud? 
RF is linked with elemental focus, burning damage, and whichever of the two AoE supports you're not using in Flame Blast. For mobility, we've got Flame Dash linked with faster casting so that we can get over ledges and jump gaps, but if I were to focus on fast mapping, I might try using Shield Charge with faster attacks instead of some of the other utility skills I'll be bringing up. Summon Stone Golem is used just for that little bit of flat life regen, not much to say about that. Assassin's Mark is the only curse that really makes sense to use. Yes, you have to self-cast it. Yes, it's annoying. Yes, it's a lot of damage. Stormbrand is used to shock and cull the bosses or any tanky boys that are giving you a hard time. I have it linked with Overcharge so that you'll get a bigger shock out of it and Culling Strike to, you know, make them dead faster. Pro tip, you don't need to level Culling Strike to max. You'll likely run into dexterity problems if you do. We also run Infernal Cry. The main purpose of this is just to cover enemies in Ash so that we can do more damage to them. But it's also really satisfying to use in big packs of monsters to see them all blow up at the same time. 10 on 10 would recommend. Lastly, for auras, we have a few options. Vitality and Precision are for sure keepers, until you're crit capped without Precision, at which point it becomes entirely redundant, and definitely wasn't something that I didn't realize was doing nothing until just now some 90 hours into playing this build. If you're not crit capped like me, and also not a complete idiot, then you will want to use Precision, just make sure not to level it completely or you'll run into dex issues. Herald of Ash is used when mapping, the Herald explosions feel great and Herald MTXs are literally the best things ever. When you're not mapping though, you can consider using Anger instead. This is more applicable to my character specifically because of the Watcher's Eye that I went for though, and Herald of Ash is a pretty close contender that reserves a lot less of your life. Both Zealotry and Determination are linked with Eternal Blessing, which lets you reserve them at no cost, but you can only have one of them active at a time. When mapping, I use Determination for the extra armor, but while bossing or in the Sanctum, I go for Zealotry, because with enough DPS, you don't have to worry about getting hit. So as you can see, you can move things around quite a bit, depending on what your goals are for the build, and I recommend that you experiment and try things out for yourself to make the build your own. Also, where you link these skills together is totally up to you so long as you remember that your main skill setup needs to be in your body armor to get that juicy plus 3 to fire skills bonus. Next up is the passive tree. I'm going to be pretty brief on this since I think passive trees are incredibly boring, but I'll go over the important stuff. And just so you know, I have different passive trees for different styles and different levels that you can check out in the path of building link I'll be leaving in the pinned comment. First off, we are a Templar and being a life stacking build, you'll want to grab all the nearby life and life regeneration nodes. For our keystones, the most important one is definitely blood magic, which makes it so that we have no mana whatsoever and our skills cost and reserve life, but we get 10% more max life, which is really nice. Call to Arms is excellent for making Infernal Cry not feel like complete garbage and allows us to put Infernal Cry on left click instead of manually pressing it each time. Glancing Blows is nice to help us get some more block chance with the trade-off being that we still take damage when we do block. I also take Unwavering Stance since I don't like getting stunned at all, but I'm honestly probably just wasting this point since our helm takes care of that problem when we're casting. Really important, make sure you get these plus 1 and 2% to max fire res nodes to help you sustain Righteous Fire degen. Otherwise, we have our cluster jewel setup that I mentioned in the gearing section and we grab some attribute nodes because we need them to equip our gems and to be crit capped. This is because our crit is scaled via either strength or intelligence, whichever is lowest thanks to our ascendancy node Righteous Provenance. You'll be trying to get into the 250 plus int and strength range in order to crit cap depending on your weapon's crit also. I recommend grabbing your ascendancy nodes in this order. Sanctuary, then Pious Path, followed by Righteous Provenance and Inevitable Judgment. I did the opposite and let me tell you, not having Pious Path while running RF sucks. Lastly, in this trial of the ancestors league we have access to tattoos and there are some cool things we can do with them first off a really nice dps boost is using an honored tattoo of the wise on one of your plus 30 int nodes which gives all of our blue gems a level boost you can also convert your small strength nodes to two percent max life nodes via honored tattoos of the oak like i've done just make sure to keep enough strength to be crit capped of course, you can fill in any resistances you're missing through tattoos too, though hopefully you're not missing cold res because dexterity is a bit of an issue. If you have infinite currency or are a taker of risks, you can try to use a journey tattoo of the Makanui to fish for pain attunement on one of your keystones, which would be freaking insane if you're using anger. Or an iron will, which would be significantly less insane, but still really good. I'm sure there are other cool tattoo options worth checking out, I just haven't looked at the full list myself and don't really plan on doing so. I think that's it for the tree. As far as bandits go, I recommend helping Alira initially for the easier time gearing, but then swapping that out for the two passive notes later on. If you don't know how, Google is your friend. As for your Pantheon, man, I'm gonna be honest, I am so lazy when it comes to the Pantheon. I pretty much just slap on Brian King and Rallakesh and call it a day without upgrading anything. That said, Brian King is pretty useless in this case, so I guess go for Arakali instead. All right, on to my leveling section. So, uh, yeah, I don't really think you should level as this build. I mean, you certainly can, and I did, but 
it wasn't the greatest. Considering this is a life stacking build that only makes use of that once you reach level 68 and can afford a Wrath of Globe, investing your passive tree points into life as much as we do means that you are going to be having barely any damage. Trust me, it ain't worth the trouble. That said, if you already have a bunch of leveling gear like a Tabula, Gold Rim, plus one Fire Wands, then it probably wouldn't be terrible. Instead, I think you're better off leveling with something stronger like Magma Orb and actually getting spell damage and fire damage on the tree, not just focusing on all life notes. I would probably only swap the Flame Blast changing your passive tree up once you get your hands on and can wear both Wrath Pith and a 6 link Infernal Mantle. They make a huge difference. This whole leveling process is the main reason I don't recommend the built in newer players or players that are in a league starting situation. Having to do a gear and passive tree swap is not a simple process for noobs and is easy to mess up and that can leave a sour taste in your mouth. Sorry for the inconvenience. As for general advice with the build, the biggest thing is going to be learning to not stand still for too long. At this point we all know that standing still equals death in a lot of cases, so make sure you're only casting flame blasts from a safe spot if you want to preserve your precious EXP. Every extra passive point is pretty significant, allowing for more jewels and more points spent on your large cluster. Against large packs of monsters, quick casts of flame blasts should be enough to get the Herald of Ash to explode the rest of the screen, so there's no need to hold the button down. Earlier I mentioned that I ran into some trouble early on in my progression when in maps, and you might be wondering how exactly I overcame that difficulty. Well, the truth is, is it came down to two things. One, I played the market for a bit to get going, and two, I had some help. You see, I actually went and reached out to the legendary Darude Firestorm himself. Turns out he was incredibly friendly, very helpful giving me all kinds of advice and suggestions based on his own experience, and to top it all off, he gave me a few gear upgrades that he had run in his stash that he no longer needed. In return, I gave him the pocket change that I had at the time, which definitely went in my favor. Did I expect this? Definitely not. I thought at best he might be willing to let me know what he was farming to make currency since I was struggling maps, and that was my main question for him initially, but he went way above and beyond that. Without his help, and even more importantly his guidance, getting this build off the ground would have been way, way more difficult. Big thanks to the Rude Firestorm, he's a genuinely great guy, and believe it or not, he farmed himself his very first Mage Blood running this build in the Sanctum. If that's not a good endorsement, I don't know what is. I think that covers pretty much everything I can think of about the build. I think it's a pretty fun off meta build, the single target is really nice IMO, and I think it's worth considering if you're looking for something a little different, but not too different. Let me know your thoughts and suggestions down in the comments. Again, POB will be pinned down there, and leave a like if you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, if you want to see what a full Sanctum run looks like with this build, then check out this video right here.